Good morning. Well, we were supposed to be on at nine o'clock this morning and about 11 o'clock last night or 1130 last night, thought it'd be a good idea to check to make sure everything was working properly and we had no sound. So instead, I'm doing this live now from my office and uh, wanted to make sure that we were still going to be able to connect. So good to have you here. Uh, and uh, hopefully next week I'll be sending some information out so that we'll be able to uh, be on at nine o'clock in the morning and, um, and you'll be able to join us there. Next week we're going to begin a, uh, a new series and it's going to be called The Badness of Blending. <clears throat> Uh, and it talks, uh, we're going to be talking about the church at Corinth and how that church many times did what they could to blend in with the culture and how that's not a good thing. Uh, the, the message is entitled Misbehaving Church. Then we're going to talk about how we are to stand out in the world as followers of Christ instead of many times blending in. Now, for many people, they see no difference in people who claim to be Christians and those who aren't. And like I said, we're going to be looking at the New Testament church in Corinth. So if you'd like to read ahead, here's what the passage, here's what we're going to talk about. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 11 to 13, and verses 18 to 24. 1 Corinthians 1, 11 to 13, and verses 18 to 24. A regular part of our worship, surprisingly, is the offering. All throughout Scripture, the offering is an indication of a person's devotion and faithfulness. Giving is a natural response of a person whose life has been transformed by the love of Jesus. Jesus gave his life. He talked about the importance of sacrifice and putting others first and giving your life to the service of others. So we receive an offering each week for the purpose of serving others. That's, that's ministry. That's the purpose of the church, to follow the example of Jesus in living and in giving. So in the church... We have plates that are in the back of the sanctuary, but if you prefer to give online, there's a donate button on the church webpage, or you can mail in your gift, as many have done and are doing. So let me thank you for your giving. Also ask that you be in prayer for our country. <clears throat> our leaders need to seek the Lord and not their own agenda and their own fame. Also, let's be in prayer about the unrest in so many of our cities. People destroying things, people rioting, people taking the law into their own hands. We need to pray for peace. We need to pray for peace in our land, and peace in our homes, and peace in our hearts. We're called to be peacemakers. So would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, we thank you that we have an opportunity to come together through the internet of all places and that we can connect as the body of Christ. And we ask that you would use this time to bring us closer to you, that we would better understand how we are to live our lives and how we can be people who bring about peace by the way we talk and the way we act. We ask you to be with those that we love, those who are struggling, those whose physical bodies are not acting in the way that they should, those whose finances are possibly a wreck. We pray for those who, who are lonely, those who are grieving. And we ask that you'd bring comfort and you would bring your peace that is beyond anything that we can even understand, and yet you offer that to us. We ask that you bless the time that we spend here this morning as we look at your word and not only look at it, but hopefully apply it, that we might become more like Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Let me say a few words to the kids. You know, I brought a, I brought a pair of binoculars with me, um, and, I, and I wanted this to be a, something that could show us how we look at things. You know, that's what binoculars do. Uh, you see things that are far away, and and they bring things closer. For instance, a lot of people use these to watch birds. Um, I, I remember one time, I, mean, I like to go to baseball games, but I never bring binoculars because it's really hard to follow a game with binoculars. But I have friends that do that. You know, you, you watch the ball being pitched and it's hard to, hard to follow the ball on the field and things like that. But people like to see things with binoculars. And these remind me of, of how we need to look at the Bible. Sometimes people read their Bibles because they feel they have to. 
Uh, but the stories of the Bible are not just a history lesson for us, but, but they're to help us find out how we should live with each other and how we should share the good news of Jesus with the rest of the world. Just think of what we could learn if we could look a little closer and spend a little bit more time reading and studying God's Word. So, so let these binoculars remind you to take a closer look at the Bible. You might discover a verse about joy that, that would help you if you're having a bad day, or how to help somebody if you find somebody in need. Take a closer look. If you regularly read your Bible, then maybe take a little bit more time and, 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 and look at a verse and, and consider it, meditate on it, or read a chapter, or read a little bit more than you're used to. And if you're not used to reading your Bible, then start by reading a few verses and just letting those verses get in your mind and your heart so that you might be able to walk closer with God. You'll be amazed at what you might find. Well, <clears throat> I'll be the first to admit that growing up I did some things that were mischievous. I guess that's what you would call it. It's a gift. Uh, whether it be tic-tacking at Halloween or uh, when I was growing up, uh, we used to go to the mall on the second floor and I would take M&Ms and I would throw them at the kids that were on the little train below. Uh, and then after we'd throw them, we'd back up so that nobody could see that. And uh, if I could get away with it, I would at least consider it. I was, I was reminded of, of that when I saw uh, uh, last week uh, a young boy who walked up to a, uh, a wedding table of, of the wedding cake and started licking the cake. He just started licking little pieces of cake, and he could get away with it. And I thought, I could see me doing that when I was growing up. You, know, you, you understand this dynamic. Sometimes we do things in life we know are wrong, and other times we engage in activities out of ignorance, and we don't know that they're wrong. Maybe you saw this. I saw this video of a trust fall. You know, businesses do trust falls all the time. What's supposed to happen is you fall back, and you're caught. You 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 put your arms like this and there are people behind you and they they catch you when you fall. However, nobody gave this guy directions. So just watch uh, this. Step up here on this chair and close your eyes. All right, and then everybody fill in and we're gonna ask you to fall and then they will catch you. So you have to trust us. I'm gonna count to three, just relax and fall, okay? One, two, three. No, wait, no, no, no! It's going to leave a mark. So here's a question I'd like for us to think about this morning. Why do I say yes to things that will hurt me and no to things that will help me? Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about the benefits of God's Word, reading, studying, meditating on it. And today, I'd like to talk about the benefits of doing what the Bible says. James, Jesus' brother, describes it this way. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Whatever looks in, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. There's a man whose name is Andras Toma. And he was in World War II when he fought for his country, Hungary, against the Soviets. The Soviets captured him in 1944. They sent him to a prison a thousand miles east of Moscow, and he was forgotten about. He didn't speak Russian. He couldn't communicate for 56 years. Everybody thought Andras was dead. In the United Nations realized that there was a Hungarian man in a Soviet prison from World War II, and they said, we need to get this man out. And the first thing he asked for after being released was a mirror. He never knew what he looked like. And folks who witnessed it said it was obvious that he did not recognize the man who was staring back at him. As followers of Jesus, we're called to be fluent in a language that is foreign to most people in this hostile world. It's the language of love. And what I would tell you about the language of love 
is that the more you speak it, the longer you speak it, it has the potential and the power to change the way you look. If you want to know the language of love, there's only one way to learn it. You have to learn it from God. Remember what God the Father said when his son Jesus was baptized. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Well, I don't, I don't think that statement is only reserved for Jesus. In fact, when the Father sees you, he said, there's my, my dearly loved daughter. There's my dearly loved son. And when you begin to see and believe how the creator of the universe feels about you and sees you that way, it will change how you behave. In psychology, there's a theory called the looking glass theory. In other words, you become what the most important person in your life thinks you are. Depending on your cluster of people that you're regularly with, that could be either a good thing or a bad thing. For instance, here's a, here's an, a very positive example. A 53-year-old man with Down syndrome is reunited with his 80-year-old dad. The son went to camp for a week, and it was the first time he was away for more than one night. Look at the language of that. You become what the most important person in your life thinks you are. When you begin to believe you're a dearly loved child of God and you bring him great joy, that'll change how you behave. James said we should not just read the Bible, we also need to respond to it. So here's what I would say is a, a working definition of obedience. Obedience says, I trust God to decide for me. I trust that God knows what's best for me compared to what I think is best for me. Columbia University has done studies that show that we will make about 70 decisions a day. And over the course of 70 years, let's even take off a few of the first years because you're not really accountable for what you're doing. Let's say over 70 years of life, that, that's about 1,788,500 choices. 1,788,500 choices. And these decisions have an impact to shape who you become. I want to challenge you to make one choice. Simplify your life and decide, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to obey God in my relationships. I'm going to obey God in my finances, in my heart, in my head. I will trust him in all things. You know, I, I read about a couple that got engaged to be married in 1902. They didn't get married until 1969. They would plan, and then they would fight, and then they would make up, and then they would plan for the wedding again, and they would fight, and they would make up. Plan, fight, make up. Does that describe your journey with God? Maybe you were raised coming to church, and then there was a season where you rebelled, and you stayed away from that, and then you got married, and you had kids, and then you started coming back, and then here you are right now. Let me share with you what's at stake. Satan cannot steal your eternal life but he can steal your abundant life. You know, we have two competing voices in our heads when it comes to obedience. I obey, therefore I'm loved. And a contrasting voice that says, I'm loved, therefore I obey. And depending on the kind of parenting you were exposed to as a kid in your church, it'll determine which you believe to be true or false. The first one, you'll never believe that God can love you. And the reason is because fear is a terrible motivator in guilt. That's why, that's why John wrote these words. This is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. It is, a, it is impossible to love someone as they should be loved without first receiving love from God. So what's that look like? God calls us to love strangers. A woman, I, I heard about a woman who was so afraid being on an airplane that, that she held a stranger's hand for 30 minutes and he let her hold his hand because he knew she needed help. When people need to be loved, we love them. Do you realize that two to four billion dollars worth of gift cards were given last Christmas and they will go unused? 
two to four billion dollars worth. Now, if that's you, let me give you my address at the church. I tell you that because so many of the Father's promises go unused by his children. That's why James said this. James said, Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they'll be blessed in what they do. In other words, James is saying, if you read God's word and you respond to God's word, then God will reward you. You know, we're so blessed as a country. I mean, let's agree to that. I went into the grocery store and the doors automatically open. Someone wipes off my cart. I, I go to the ice cream aisle. You know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to hug Mr. Edie and Mrs. Mrs. Briars. What a, what a great place. Every decision you regret in your life is totally forgiven if you ask to be forgiven. Eternally and completely forgiven. You know, my marriage, I don't have to guess. It's in, it's in here. Crystal clear. I'm not supposed to get anything from Cheryl. I'm supposed to give to her. Dying to myself, I'm filled with life. Parenting, my kids love Jesus. And our job was to raise kingdom servant leaders. And I'm going to spend eternity with them and with you. I don't deserve that. And I'm so blessed. When you understand love, it makes obedience so much easier. The Apostle Paul said this to the church at Corinth. He said, now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. I know people, I know people who know their Bible, but don't know their neighbors, or even Jesus. That's why James goes on to say, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Let me remind you of your role. Please continue to be generous. Here's why the Apostle Paul said this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. So let's go back to the question, why do I say yes to things that will hurt me and no to the things that will help me? I'm sure all of us have at least one thing that we're ungrateful for regarding the blessings of God. Maybe maybe you need to be aware of your words coming coming in and going out. You know, social media, social media is so often a toilet bowl. We need to be very careful what we read and what we post. If, if, if there are language that's bad in it, don't post it. If there's coming from a questionable site that has things that I would be embarrassed to have somebody see, don't post it. Stay away from it. Maybe it's something physical. Maybe we need to exercise more. Maybe we have the COVID weight on now. Maybe we need to watch what we eat. Maybe you're involved in too many hobbies and your marriage has taken a back seat. Maybe your finances. Maybe you, need to, maybe you spend your money foolishly. You, know, you should adopt the 10-10-80 rule. Give 10% to the church, save 10%, and live on 80%. Or how about a dating standard? Don't lower your standards so you sacrifice your core convictions. Don't do that. James says, we want, we, want to, we want to read this book and respond to this book. And when we do, God is going to reward us. So what does that look like? Well, I saw two different things. First of all, there's this dad. He, he, he holds signs up for his daughter when, just to embarrass his daughter when she gets off a plane. And she play, I guess she flies frequently, but she knows he loves her. He, he makes these signs just to embarrass her. And, and it, even though it embarrasses her, it makes her feel so good. And then there's this brother who greets his little brother every day when he goes out to school. Every single day. And every single day he greets him, he's wearing a different costume. Now, let's meet. you watch this.
Here's the reality. There's coming a day when we will be home and our dad and older brother will greet us and he won't humiliate us. He will reward us. Congratulations, come on in. Share in my happiness. I want you to experience that. <clears throat> you know, someday God's going to make this place right. Sin hijacked it, but this is where home's going to be. Th that'll be heaven, heaven on earth. There are so many places when I get to heaven you know, that, that I can't wait to see. And, and I'm going to build a campfire, and we could just simply hang out. It's going to be beautiful, and it's going to be incredible. C.S. Lewis, in his Chronicles of Narnia, the seven, seven novels, said in his last book, The Last Battle, these words, The things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, the end of all the stories, this is the end, and we can only truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. In heaven, time will no longer work against us. It'll always work for us. For instance, an apple, an apple right now, if you eat it, it turns brown and soft and it'll rot here, but it's going to be different in heaven. In heaven, that won't happen. Fruit will taste increasingly better with every bite. Conversations will get better and better each time we talk. You know, it's hard, hard for us to get our heads around it. But I'd hope your heart is already there. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, which is known as the love chapter, these words. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully even as I'm fully known. It's going to be great. Let's get there together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We can read it. We can study it. We can meditate on it. But most importantly, we need to do what it says. And when we do what it says, when we follow what you say, you show us love. And you give us direction for our lives. We ask that you direct us this week. That we would be able to show love to others because you have first loved us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week. Nine o'clock. Have a great week.